Hey, Fiddle Flea returning with another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is uh, Monday, or no, Tuesday, the 21st of September, 2021. Uh, click on the subscribe button in the lower right if you want to subscribe to future episodes and also the uh, notification bell in the upper right. Today's talk is being diverse is not a job. Today's America is self-absorbed with relative relative trivialities compared to the objective evils in other parts of the world, at least in some of them. During recent years, while China has been putting a million or more Muslim residents in so-called re-education camps, which are essentially concentration camps, America has been unable to look outward. Our only goal seems to teach our students and ourselves to hate our country until it achieves diversity. But being diverse is not a job. If that's your job, you put together an organization that is diverse, maybe in terms of skin color and gender, and it merely sits there. It doesn't accomplish anything. Today, America absurdly thinks it is turning diversity into a job. Meanwhile, we abandon traditional values. We replace them with safe spaces, cancel culture, and chaos, as well as cultural genocide in the South. We dismantle our academically best high schools, lowering admission standards in the name of diversity. Schools that are supposed to challenge America's brightest students. I wouldn't have been able to get in them. Students with the brightest students to the, to the highest accomplishments. We want to challenge them to the highest accomplishments. And they are being weighed down by excessive affirmative action enrollees. We destroy testing systems that enable the best suited students to get into the college best suited for them. Oregon has even abolished all academic requirements for graduating high school, thereby making the diplomas meaningless. Our corporations, government institutions, and military waste hundreds of millions of dollars on diversity propaganda and so-called anti-racist trading. Chief among such institutions is the military. Only three months or so ago, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Army General Mark Milley, testified that he wanted to learn more about so-called white rage as if it were a significant internal threat to America. In the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion, his army disparages Confederate memory and will be replacing the names of all bases that have long been namesakes for generations and lifetimes, actually. They've been namesakes for uh, Confederate generals. While distracted by such trivial obsessions, Milley failed in Afghanistan. He and his boss, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, have dodged responsibility for the debacle shamelessly. Both refused the honorable option of resigning so that better leaders can replace them. And they even, even as they denounce Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller for criticizing them and thereby losing his job. Colonel Scheller is a better example. He lost his job by criticizing those above him. And these two guys who were responsible to us, the, uh, uh, the voters of America, they have no shame. They are shamelessly refusing to resign and take, they are refusing to take responsibility. They point their fingers at somebody else. Given the wimpy performance of woke leaders like Miller, Millie and Austin, America's military should once again consider the potential inspiration that respect for Confederate veterans might provide to a, today's army. The descendants carried Confederate symbols, their descendants carried uh, Confederate symbols into battle to signify that the fighting spirit remained. And they did this in all, American, uh, all of Amer America's major wars after 1865. Failures like Millie and Austin show us that Americans should be wary of tearing down century-old Confederate statues. Dishonoring them implicitly demeans later generations of American warriors who were inspired by the Confederate soldier and did much perform much better than either Millie or Austin. During World War II, 
the, Amer the first American flag to fly over the captured Japanese fortress at Okinawa was a Confederate battle flag. It was put there by a group of Marines to honor their company commander, a South Carolinian who, ha who uh, had suffered a paralyzing wound during the fight. They did it to honor him. And these were Marines from all over the country. Some of the tank crews that freed prisoners from the German concentration camps also flew the Confederate battle flag. Finally, postbellum Southerners consistently came to our nation's defense more readily than did other Americans. Even presently, 44% of American military personnel are from the South, even though the region represents just 36% of the nation's population. If the Afghan collapse teaches us anything, it should be that a country taught first to hate Southerners and then to hate itself cannot succeed. It is going to put incompetence obsessed with wokeness like Milley and Austin in control. When General Robert E. Lee, in contrast, lost at Gettysburg, he rode out to meet the soldiers returning from Pickett's failed charge. Unlike Milley and Austin, he immediately took responsibility for the failure before soldiers of every rank right there on the battlefield. After he got his army safely back into Virginia, he sent his resignation to President Jefferson Davis, but Davis declined it. Lee never thereafter blamed anyone except himself for the defeat at Gettysburg. His leadership was the kind that might have inspired today's army leaders to better results in Afghanistan. Almost certainly they would have, but those leaders must first end their obsession with demonizing the Confederate soldier and distracting themselves with the self-hatred generated by so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion propaganda. So here's something I want to share with you. This is my book, Trading with the Enemy. Or excuse me, no, it isn't. This is Causes of the Civil War. And this is an important book because it's it, most people, when they discuss the causes of the Civil War, they look at why the South seceded, but they do not examine why the Northern states decided to fight. And if you, this book will show you a big factor was that the North wanted high protective tariffs so that they could monopolize domestic industries such as cotton textiles, woolen textiles, and iron products. For example, it, it, the, the pri tariffs prior to the war were 19% on dutiable items. They went to 45%, an average of 45% for the next 50 years. What further evidence could anyone want that this was the objective of the, uh, the Northerners? After the Civil War ended in uh, eight, uh, 1865, the, the year after that, um, railroad iron cost $80 a ton in the United States, but it was $32 a ton in Liverpool. The South, which badly needed to rebuild its railroads, had to pay the $80 a ton. And um, the, it was the, the, the argument about tariffs is so misunderstood. People, want, people keep wanting to look at you know, where, who paid the tariffs. The point of a protective tariff is not to generate revenue. The, the industries that want protection don't want any revenue generated by a tariff. Because if there's no revenue generated by a tariff, it means that no imports in their sector came into the United States, thereby making them domestic monopolies. And that is the key thing to understand about tariffs. The North went to war over tariffs, not the South. Okay, the book is $26 at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If you'd like to have an autographed copy, you can get one from me for, uh, excuse me, at $22 at Barnes and Noble and Amazon, you can get it from me autographed for $25. And here in the United States, I'll cover the postage. But you got to email me, Phil, P-H-I-L underscore Lee, L-E-I-G-H at me, M-E.com. Okay, that's our show for today. I'll see you next time. Thank you.